I don't think subscription is something you can experiment with. I think you, you've got to be full on board with it. You've got to understand its benefits. You've got to be in for, for the long term. And if you just try to dip your toe in the water, oh, we're going to try it with these three customers, you're not going to get the full impact of it. It's, it's a system-wide change. Welcome to the Smart Strategy for CPAs podcast, where I help you work less and make more. My name is Geraldine Carter. Subscription is all the rage right now, but a lot of CPAs are stuck when it comes to implementing the subscription model in their business, including wondering how to price it and what to include. And a lot of CPAs are still stuck billing by the hour. What they often struggle to understand is the full depth of the value they offer to their clients. And because they don't fully appreciate the value, they're leaving ever sized mountains of money on the table which means they have to work a whole lot harder to compensate for the missed opportunity. Here today to talk with me about this problem is my guest, Ron Baker. Ron is the author of numerous books, including Implementing Value Pricing and Mind Over Matter, Why Intellectual Capital is the Chief Source of Wealth. He's received countless awards for his contributions to the accounting profession, and he is the founder of the Verisage Institute, a think tank dedicated to teaching value pricing. Ron Baker, welcome back to the Smart Strategy for CPAs podcast. Thanks, Geraldine. Thrilled to be here. So we're talking about the subscription business model. And for listeners, if you want to hear our previous conversation, it's episode 81, which aired about a year ago at this time. I'll link to it in the show notes. I've done a few other episodes on pricing, which I will also link to in the show notes. But we want to talk about the subscription model because there's buzz everywhere. So let's start with a simple definition to get folks on the same page. What is subscription and what is it not? Boy, I don't know if there's a good definition. You know, one of the problems with this business model is we lack the vocabulary to define it and articulate it. It's one of the things I struggle with as a writer. We don't have a good vocabulary for this. So I can't even give you a clear, concise definition of what this business model is other than to say what makes the subscription model I think unique is it puts the relationship at the center of the business. There is no room for silos. It puts customer long-term value on every single dashboard. That's what you're looking at. You're no longer looking at realization, utilization, billable hours. That that is uh, There is no place for that in subscription. So all the KPIs change, everything you look at, the dashboards change, the relationship is at the center, innovation is constant and baked in to the model. You have to continuously innovate. And and there's probably other things I can think about this. It's a choice architectural business model, meaning that the psychological aspects of purchasing transactions from a firm, tax return, bookkeeping, whatever, versus subscribing to a firm are totally different. Once I have a relationship and I I am subscribed to something, I don't know, call it the Ikea effect, call it the endowment effect. You know, once you build something from Ikea, even though it's lopsided, but you spend eight hours, you're invested in it. I mean, it's yours. You you put all this time into it. It's got to be good. There's something about that in the subscription model and we can't articulate it and I can't quantify it on a spreadsheet. I can't put an ROI number by it, but I know it's there. You psychologically have a different relationship with those businesses that you subscribe to, whether it's Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, Disney Plus, you name it. You name a subscription and my guess is, unless you just really didn't use it or didn't find it valuable, that you have a completely different relationship with how you buy everything else. To me, that's amazing. The other aspect of it is it's got insurance built into it. And when I say insurance, I mean insurance with an EN, not an IN. And that means that you're taking responsibility for producing a result. And to me, that's what being a professional is all about. A professional is someone who is responsible for creating a result, not delivering tasks. And the billable hour, and even to some extent value pricing, still denominates everything, or at least talks about everything in terms of tasks. And yet that's not what we professionals do. 
I don't go to my eye doctor and get an eye exam and then buy glasses and then frames and no, I'm there for perfect eyesight. That's a completely different, it's the difference between the means and the ends. Yes, the eye exam is a means to an end and the glasses are a means to an end, but the end is eyesight. That's really what I'm paying for. The subscription model forces you to articulate and communicate and market and position and have a strategy built around that end purpose, not the means. The customer could care less about the means. They want the ends. Yeah, so the customer could totally care less about the means and they want the ends. But so let me just play devil's advocate here because you could do those things that you just mentioned, the ends, not the means, and focusing on results, communicating value, finding opportunity, all the rest. You could do it without a subscription model. You could figure out how to price and get paid in advance and all the rest without necessarily going to recurring revenue. So if I'm a listener who's a CPA, who's like, oh my God, I still can't get my head around this. I'm thinking in their head, they're not yet convinced that I should even bother getting my head around this. So the question is, what's the opportunity that isn't being capitalized on by not considering how you can work this into your business? Well, I, I agree with you, Geraldine. I mean, this is, this is we're, we're back to the left side and I mean the far left side of the crossing the chasm bell curve. We're over in the innovators. So that's two and a half percent. I suspect most accounting firms will not adopt the subscription model. And for those that don't, I'd say go into value pricing. That's a better model than hourly billing. It's a better model than fixed fees. And yes, you can do all the things that I just said with a value pricing model, except for this, even the value pricing model pays lip service to the relationship. We all pay lip service to the relationship. One of the reasons is because we don't measure it. We don't measure customer lifetime value. We measure, even in value pricing to some extent, the math of the moment rather than customer lifetime value. So if you're interested in building a business that is going to be more valuable than say one times, maybe two times revenue, <laughs> then you've got to have annual recurring revenue. That's not my judgment. That's the market's judgment. That's how Pilot, you know, got 300 million from Jeff Bezos and, and with a valuation of $1.2 billion. They have a thousand customers. I'm sure you know many firms that have a thousand customers. Tell me if they could sell for $1.2 billion. Yeah, no, we're looking at 0.75x or half x, depending. So if you, I mean, depending on who you listen to. So it, exactly, exactly. And, it, and, and look, I'm not saying that pilot is not overvalued. I happen to think it is because I don't think there's economies of scale in this profession. But put that aside, the market is clearly sending a signal, a price signal, which is rich in information that we value businesses that have annual recurring revenue. So if you're interested in building wealth, beyond the transactional math of the moment, then you've got to consider subscription. It's far superior to value pricing. But, you know, this is going to take a long time. This this will probably take as long to diffuse as value pricing did. Okay, got it. So really, it's about if you want something long term, if you're building a business for the long term, that you want to sell for something that's far more significant than what you're potentially going to sell it at if you stick with business as usual transaction selling deliverables, that subscription will land you in a place that where your business has far more value than the traditional model. Right. And I, I would also say that the reason you became, sit back and ask yourself why you became a CPA in the first place. My guess is it was to help people, whether individuals or businesses, maybe a combination of both. You did not enter this profession to bill the most hours. You did not enter this profession to have the highest volume and the most customers. The more customers you have, the less you can do for every one of them. So if you really want to be a, a full breadth depth advisor, you know, I hate the term trusted advisor, but if you use that term, if you want to be that, you can't have a thousand customers. You can't, you can't even have a hundred. You might be able to have 50, and if you have 50, then you can have deep relationships with them. 
and you can make a bigger impact on their lives and you don't have to do as much marketing and acquisition and climbing down learning curves with new customers. I mean, existing customers are seven to 11 times more profitable according to the AICPA than going out chasing a new one. Um, the, the subscription model puts a premium on those relationships. I think older business models, whether it's hourly billing or value pricing, we pay lip service to the relationship because we're still placing volume over value. And, and I think that's a big problem. I think almost every firm I know has too many customers. You just can't, you can't be all things to all people. You have to put yourself in a box. So I'd be curious to come back to the piece about value pricing and paying lip service and uh, how that still results in too many clients because I'm seeing something different in what I'm, you know, in what I'm seeing in my subset of clients, but that's for the next time we have you back. So, <laughs> so I want to come back to the specifics of the subscription model and ways that keep people can think about implementing it in their business. In particular, talk about the idea to start of monthly recurring revenue as one way, but there are lots of other ways. So how do you see business owners successfully implementing the shift simply to monthly recurring revenue with delivery of service? Yeah, and I think a lot of firms, like you said at the start, you know, they kind of have this idea that subscription just means taking the fixed price and dividing by 12. No, I'm getting monthly payments now, and that's a subscription. Uh, subscription is not a pricing stack. It's not a pricing method. It is a total business model. So the purist in me wants to answer your question that you can't just gradually shift to this. You need to open up a new firm and start from ground zero because the legacy systems are all gone in your old firm, whether it's hourly billing, fixed fees, or value pricing. We just blew them apart. They're useless. Everything you measured, everything you did, everything you said you did um, doesn't work in a subscription model. So I think the companies that have the most success are the ones that spin out a new subsidiary and, and you know, it ultimately will cannibalize uh, the old one. And we even saw this in value pricing. It was so hard for firms to implement value pricing that some did spin out where they spun out the old practice and just started value pricing in the new practice with the higher end customers. Um, short of that, I, and look, I know that's a radical thing and most people are going to be turned off by that idea. But short of that, I don't think subscription is something you can experiment with. I think you, you've got to be full on board with it. You've got to understand its benefits. You've got to be in for, for the long term. And if you just try to dip your toe in the water, oh, we're going to try it with these three customers, you're not going to get the full impact of it. It's, it's a system-wide change. And I can't just break apart a system, right? I need, like I can't cut off my hand at my wrist and, and have it right, right? It needs the rest of my body. So I'm really skeptical about little experiments with this because they show me that the firm is not committed to it. Okay. So say the firm is committed and they think to themselves, okay, we see the value. We're going from a thousand clients down to 50 and we're going all in on subscription. So what are they going to include in their services or like everything plus the kitchen sink, you want it, you name it, it's paid for. And if so, is there just one option, which isn't an option if it's just one, to work with them? Or is there a menu of, let's say, three options tiered for different levels of service that vary based on the level of service? Right. This is part of the vocabulary. I, we're not doing services anymore. It's tiered based on the level of coverage. Yes. Thank you. Right. Because we're covering things that may or may not happen. You may not get audited, but if you're in the right tier, you're covered if you do. You may not need you know, to adjust your estate plan, but if you're in the right tier, you're covered if, if you do need to, right? So how do we put a price on an unknown service? And how can I compare your firm that covers me in all these eventualities, or, or maybe a limited number, depending on the tier you're in, um, how can I compare that price to somebody who doesn't offer that? Who's going to charge me for every little thing I do, like an auto mechanic, you know, every little, uh, part I put on, you know, I'm going to get a separate charge. I'm going to get nickel and dimed. I think it's an enormous competitive advantage. Uh, so yes, you would, I would offer options 
and I would tear things. But I think before you can even start there, you need to step back. This is a strategy issue and a positioning issue and a value proposition issue. Um, you know, and I kind of go back to Peter Drucker's five most important questions. First, of course, is your purpose, your firm, you know, why does your firm exist? You know, why do you get up out of bed in the morning? Why should anybody care? But then who is your customer? And by definition, that means putting yourself in a box by, you know, saying who's not your customer. I think a firm is defined by the customers and services it doesn't offer. What does that customer value? You know, this is probably the most important question and the least asked. Um, but what does a customer value? Well, it's not the eye exam and the glasses. It's the perfect eyesight. So in a customer's mind, yes, their books need to be balanced, but they also want peace of mind. They also want convenience. They also want a frictionless customer experience. They don't, they, it, they don't, they want it to be hassle free, like ordering from Amazon prime is. And the, the subscription model, you can do that. I don't, I think that's much harder in an hourly billing or even in a value pricing world. What are the results? What are the ends that your particular customers are looking for? And what is your, what is your strategy? And that's all I, that takes place long before pricing. If, and again, if you put yourself in a box and you're clearly defined on who your customer is and you know, what services you offer, if you're niched, then I think this becomes much easier to figure that out. I too see the same thing that people want to figure out price, but before you figure out price, you've got to swim upstream and go to the source, which is who is your customer? What's your value proposition? And a number of other things before you can get downstream to price because it's in price is informed by so many things. I'm, you know, I hear, I too hear, I'm trying to figure this out on the fly. There aren't a lot of people to look to who are doing it successfully. Let me just say the bar right now is so low for differentiation that you don't have to be very different in order for it to be useful. But I think if we keep the carrot as your firm in the long run will be far more valuable by going in this direction, then that keeps me wondering about, you know, what are the ways that the different aspects of subscription, the different kind of tools underneath it can be built in? which makes me think about John Warlow's book, The Automatic Customer, and the nine different ways that he sees subscription. And CPAs by nature are not innovative people, right? It's not, necess- it's not baked into who they are. So how can we help them in this moment think creatively about what they could include in their businesses? So I'm thinking about front of the line, right? How do you cut the line? How do you get faster service? How would you bake that into a tiered model, for example? Well, we've seen that baked in even with value pricing, you know, in terms of response time, certain levels get faster replies, certain levels have maybe your, your, your phone number, your cell number, you know, so they can text you on the weekends, other, you know, the lower price tiers might, you might get back to them in 24 hours or 48 hours. My model for this, Geraldine, is the concierge medicine We've already got a model. It's been around since 1996, concierge doctor. I, I, the parallels between what a GP does, a, a physician, and what a CPA does, I think, are unbelievably <laughs> linked. I mean, there, there's a ton of parallels. Now, there's some differences, too, but there's, an enor- there's, more, there's more similarities than differences. And whether you're looking at concierge doctors or direct primary care doctors, which is a goes after a lower uh, target market, you know, a lower price point in the market. Um, they've kind of got this figured out. They, you know, for a hundred bucks a month or sometimes 150, whatever, <clears throat> you're covered for whatever that GP can do. Now they might have different tiers based on your age. So it's not really a choice. You get slammed into a tier based upon your age because that's a proxy for, you know, you, how, how you're going to use the doctor. But the point is that they cover anything that they're capable of doing. And I think that's how you have to think about this. You have to think about covered and uncovered service. And you're right. I, CPAs aren't innovative. And, and the reason they're not innovative is because their business model doesn't reward it. Even value pricing doesn't reward it that much. The subscription economy does because with the, with the subscription economy, you're trying to grow lifetime customer value. So it's in front of your face, it's on your income statement, all the time you're looking at it. 
It's built into the model of the business. And also, you're highly worried about churn. You've got to keep your customers delighted. So now you have an incentive, just as much as Netflix and Amazon Prime have an incentive to innovate. And so I think the reason we don't innovate is because it's not aligned with our business model. This aligns it with the business model. So I, when, when I think about this model in a CPA firm um, and, and say, you know, you had a traditional CPA firm that had, you know, uh, uh, client outsource accounting services, cloud accounting service, whatever you want to call it. I'm so over all these acronyms, CAS and all this stuff. Um, but it, say you had that, say you had tax and maybe you had uh, advisory. Well, uh, you could have a tier that just did CAS, you know, but you're going to do everything, everything that you're capable of doing. Now, this is much easier, of course, if you're niched. If you have nothing but dentists, they're all going to have the same chart of accounts. You're going to put them all on the same type of bookkeeping system. You're going to use the same apps. You know, you're not, there's no complexity tax in this model, right? When you're niched like that, but you're only going to do cash for them. Now, others might say, well, I want you to do our books and I want you to do our taxes. And then you slide them into the middle tier and that covers them for anything you can do tax. So corporate uh, personal, their kids, if they get audited, all those types of things would be covered. And then of course, if they need advisory services, maybe you help them with marketing, maybe you help them with a succession plan, maybe you help them bring in a partner or, or exit a partner, whatever it is, that advisory, you have that available. And if they need that for some things or one thing, they can slide up, they can upgrade to it. But then once it's done, they can, they can downgrade back to where they were. So it's got to be completely flexible. It's got to be cancelable at any moment. There's no lock in here. This isn't like the old Verizon one where you're locked in for two years or three years and, you know, it cost a fortune to get out. I've seen some firms try and do that. I think it's a huge mistake. One of the things that behavioral economists have taught us about subscription is you've got to have the cancel button everywhere. It's got to be really simple to cancel it. And counterintuitively, what happens when you make it easy to cancel is people don't which is, see, this is part of the psychology that is fascinating about this model. Um, in fact, the statistic is once somebody is a member for one year, you have a 90% chance of having them for life. So, I mean, there's ways that you've got to think about it, but one of the things I would say is your pricing has to go up. Uh, I mean, you've got it because you're covering things that are unforeseen that, that, the customer may not need now, but may need in the future because you're planning growth in there. You know, hopefully you're, I want my customer's businesses to grow. We've saw what happened when they die last year, right? That's not fun. I want them to grow. I want them to have more employees. I want them to have more accounts and credit cards and all that kind of stuff that creates more work for us. But I want that because that's a leading indicator that I'm serving a healthy client base and all that's covered. It's covered. It doesn't matter that they added 10 employees and now your payroll, you know, processing time goes up, I don't know, five minutes. It doesn't matter. It's covered. That's part of the frictionless. That's part of the peace of mind. That's just part of convenience to the customer. But it should be worked into a price premium across the portfolio of customers, probably somewhere between a factor of two and five. And that's going to freak a lot of people out. And they're going to say, well, they're it's going to price me out of the market. How do you know? Because if, if I'm quoting a $5,000 a month price and I'm covering you for a bunch of things that you may need, um, probably will need if you're a growing business and the firm down the street's giving you a quote based on a defined scope of work and they're going to nickel and dime you for everything that changes from that defined scope. How can you compare those two prices? Yeah. So what I want to pull on in there, because I'm sitting here going, absolutely, you've got to raise your rates. The The reason or a reason that I think CPAs will be digging their heels in on this is because of the potential risk in their mind of what if somebody shows up with a big project that I didn't foresee, didn't anticipate, and now I'm losing my shirt. And the answer to that is you've, like you say, got to raise your rates, bump them way up 2x, 5x. And what that's making me think is understanding and more deeply appreciating the value of things that you just mentioned that need to get included in the marketing. 
like the frictionless, right? You want it, you got it. If you if you need to bump up to this next level of service, given where your business is, you bump up for the time period that you need it, and then you go back down. You can upgrade, you can downgrade. And the the simplicity of that, the absence of nickel and diming, and all these other things that are so-called intangible that many people believe are immeasurable because they're intangible, which neither of which typically is true. But getting CPAs to wrap their brains around the value of these things that they haven't really thought about before because they've been so busy focusing on minutes and hours. So what's the mentality here that needs to change? Thinking that what happens if that client comes to me and they need something, a big project? Um, That's great. First off, they came to you first. Would you like them to go to a competitor maybe? How would you like them to go to a consultant instead of you? We fight about this all the time, right? We want that additional work. Well, now subscription, it's yours. <laughs> Who are they going to call first? They're, you're, your, you're their first call shop. Now, I'm not saying you can do everything. Maybe there's some things you can't do. Just like a GP, he might have to refer it to a specialist, but he's going to quarterback that relationship for that patient. He might even show up at that specialist appointment you know, with you. Um, but it, see, that's what I mean by putting the relationship first. That puts the relationship first. The fact of the matter is, I'm not, I'm not trying to tie profitability to a particular service, right? I'm tying it to lifetime value. That's the mindset that needs to change. We need to break this link. And VP, I thought, might have done it, but it didn't. We need to break this link between price and services. Yeah. We just need to break that link. We're, we're professionals. We, we take res- responsibility for an outcome, an end. And that's part of the mindset. But that's really hard. I, I think it goes back to cost accounting and profit per job, profit per customer. How do I know profit per customer? You don't. <laughs> you don't because the subscription business model income statement doesn't let you do that. It looks at lifetime value. And your, and your growth and annual recurring revenue. It's forward directed. It's not looking backwards. And, and the other thing is, and it ties into this, is you always need to have capacity, right? Dr. Paul, who we inter- interview is a DPC doctor in Detroit. And, you know, he's, got, he's always got capacity. If, I, if he's my doctor and I text him, he's probably going to get back with, to me, he said, with about a half hour. He'll probably be able to respond unless he's in consultation. And, you know, that means I can get on a FaceTime with them. I mean, these guys were doing telemedicine long before COVID, long, long before COVID. Um, you have access to them. And you know what he said? He said, we've had to train our patients to spend more time with us. He said, I just don't want to see you when you're sick. I want to see you when you're healthy so I can keep you that way. Now, if you have that mindset, you're no longer worried about the special project. You're thrilled to be able to serve them because that's what's gonna lock them in and, and, and see you as very, very valuable, even at a two times price. For business owners who are busy and their time matters to them and they use it wisely and judiciously, who don't wanna wait four days to hear back from their CPA, they want an answer to a quick question as quick as they can get it, that the value of access, of quick access is you know, infinite, right? Because being able to make good decisions quickly is really valuable. So, I mean, I'm just sitting here going, this model enables you to pin yourself as the premium offer in the space because nobody else is doing that. And if you want a high level of service with great answers fast, come to us. You're going to pay for it, but it'll be worth it. And nobody else around you is doing it. From a marketing standpoint, you don't have a lot of competition. So I want to talk about some other options that I suspect many CPAs might not be considering because it doesn't fall under the wheelhouse of what they do. And oftentimes there's value that's totally disconnected from what we actually do. And I have in mind the community that you create. I have in mind the network of other clients around you who have similar problems and getting them connected, right? And being a business owner can be lonely sometimes. You don't have anybody to talk to who's got the same problems you do. What else can CPAs potentially include in their subscription that would be enormously valuable, but has little to do with tax and accounting? 
Oh, that's a great question. And I think there's a lot and, and you can build it off that community. Now think about a community if you did nothing but dentists and got them together and, and had a round table, you know, CEO round table or dentist round table or whatever, um, that, that would be incredibly valuable. They talk about best practices, talk about what's going on in the industry, what they see, um, you know, dentists are another one that can move to subscription <laughs> and should, there are some that, that are, um, so I think there's that, there's lots of things you can do to tap into that social capital that we just don't even think about CEO round tables, CFO round tables, entrepreneurial round tables, startup, round, you know, wh whatever market you serve in, you know, what are their needs, what are their special tax considerations, whether they're special insurance, estate planning strategies in that particular industry. There's lots you can do. Bring in outside speakers that, you know, can talk to your group and you could facilitate those things either virtually or you could do some of them live. Um, I think there's a lot to do there and you could put that into a higher tier. You know, that would be your black card offering, um, you know, like American Express by invitation only type of thing. So I think there are many other things uh, like that, that you could do that have nothing to do with your services that are just tap into your social capital. You have all these people in your social capital, you know, like insurance agents, bankers, all these specialists that, that can also serve your customers would love a chance to get in front of your customers. Uh, probably be happy to give them a talk or whatever on whatever it is they offer. Uh, and the customers would love that because it's a safe environment. They don't feel like they're being sold to, you know, it's not like a condo sale or whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I, the, uh, I think you're only limited there by your imagination. Remember Mark Wickersham did a, a program I watched where he gave 25 ideas of what a firm could bundle into its packages. And I don't remember them all. I, ha I have them somewhere, but th it was really good. Uh, it, it just, it's just a matter of, you know, trying things, see what works, you know, experimenting. There's, there's a lot of ways to create value. I love that you bring that up, trying and experimenting, because you are trying and experimenting with your own subscription model with TSOE. So how is that going? And what have you learned along the way? And maybe just for listeners, give them a high level on, you know, your five levels and what we're even talking about. <laughs> wow. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but yeah, we do have. I can tell you. <laughs> but, but, wow. Okay, we do have five levels that you can subscribe to TSOE, and we did that because we, when we started the show, the first thing we heard was, you know, why do we have to sit through these commercials? And so, we we started making the show available without the commercials, and that was a, done at a subscription level through Patreon, and then we decided to add to it. So we've got various levels uh, that we offer various things and. Um, you know, like a relearning uh, episode where we take one show and kind of dive deeper. What have we learned since? Whatever. We have book chats. We have wine and cheeses, you know, virtual get togethers. It's just a way to share um, knowledge, really. I mean, that's really when you think about it, that's all we're doing is sharing knowledge. Um, it's fun. It's a committed audience base. You know, I, I rather, I rather, I rather have. 20 fanatical customers than 500 kind of half-ass customers, you know, half committed to me, the firm, whatever. And it, you can't, you just can't be all things to all people. So you, you, you just got to kind of grow it organically. Yes, it's a slower form of growth, but it's more targeted. It's more rich. And I think it aligns more with why you entered the profession in the first place. So experimentation is a big part of, of any pricing model. You should be constantly experimenting, whether you're doing a VP 1.0 or hourly billing, you, because you're pricing the customer. Each customer is like a random controlled trial experiment, right? You, you're pricing that one single customer. So you can try different things. You can offer different options, see what works, see what doesn't, see the kind of feedback you get and adjust. We need to be more open to experimentation and I think the subscription model opens up that as well because you can constantly slide things in to your various offerings and you can pull them out if they're not valued or if they don't work or you can't make them work, whatever it is. But at least you're going to be trying things just like Amazon does. Let's talk a little bit about the accounting side of this because in Tianzo's book, Subscription, 
he you know, talks about swallowing the fish and you know learning a new set of metrics and KPIs to keep an eye on. What do you think CPAs and accountants would benefit from in terms of understanding the accounting aspect of the subscription model? Yeah, first, I, it, usually when we talk about this, I actually show now the P&L first. I show that, you know, we all know the traditional P&L, but the subscription economy starts with annual recurring revenue, and then it backs out the revenue lost due to churn, you know, the customers who left. And then so you get this net annual recurring revenue. And then, of course, you've got your your recurring costs, you know, your human capital, your rent, that type of thing, technology. And then you've got sales and marketing. So you're advertising and marketing and all of that. And then you put in new annual recurring revenue. So your income statement actually ends up with an ending ARR, annual recurring revenue, that rolls forward. So everything about this income statement is future directed. And then, of course, the metrics you're looking at, like monthly recurring revenue, annual contract value or lifetime customer value, customer acquisition costs, churn rates, um, you know, uh, and there's other metrics that you can look at as well. You can even download a couple reports from Andreessen Horowitz, which is the famous venture capital firm. Uh, They have two reports out there on the metrics that they look at to evaluate subscription-based businesses. And there's lots of different metrics, you know, upselling and, um, you know, how much more revenue did you bring in from, say, existing customers rather than just adding new customers, those types of things. Um, So it's a whole new vocabulary. Now, accountants kind of understand this if they have anybody on subscription, and especially if they are following the new, you know, uh, gap standards. Uh, they kind of know how to account for this, but but it is new for those who probably aren't doing that type of work. Uh, it requires them to kind of rewire the, the brain on how they think about the traditional income statement because it's completely different. The, the other thing I would add to that, Geraldine, is, is um, lifetime customer value is not as tangible as costs. I know my cost. Co- I know my rent. I know what I pay my people. I know my costs. Most CPA firms know their cost to a penny. Lifetime customer value, though, has to be modeled and it has to be projected. It's less tangible. It's, it, I, it's less precise. And that, that gives us fits as accountants because, you know, we rather be precisely wrong rather than approximately right. And quite frankly, I'd rather be approximately right about, you know, the right metric than precisely wrong about the wrong one. Um, but that's that's a big, big mindset. You, you got to move off of this idea of profit per job, profit per customer, and think about lifetime value, you know, because how would you feel if you didn't do that big project for that customer that you complained about, and then they went over to a competitor and you lost them in six months. How would that make you feel? And what would it cost to replace them? I'd rather do the job. And this gives us a mechanism to monetize that relationship because it's not tied to specific work, it's tied to the relationship. This is also interesting. There's so much here that I wanna open up, but I wanna go back to where we started Something you said at the outset that you think that this is going to take a long time for firms to adopt, and it's possible that many won't do it at all. Coupled with, you know, I said CPAs don't tend not to be innovative, which I think sometimes is an unfair characterization because I've worked with some folks who are super innovative and have come up with really cool, valuable products that have been really valuable and clever. And not to mention, they come up with strategies for their customers, like tax strategies. Yes. To, well, that's what I'm, yeah, that's what I'm talking y- about. Yeah. Un- unbelievable creativity in that. <laughs> but it's like the plumber, right? He's got, got the worst toilet. Well, there's a lot to say here about creativity, and it's kind of a curse word in the space because of you know the insinuation. The incentive when you bill by the hour doesn't reward creativity and innovation. So once you get out of it, suddenly the incentive becomes, how can I do this faster? How can I make this better? How can I add more value here? And now the incentive is to become innovative. So it makes me wonder if the profession by nature attracts people who kind of like methodical and, you know, equations for things and always one nice neat answer. 
or if that's just a result of the pricing model. Whereas in fact, once you release the oppression of the billable hour, you unleash all this creativity in the space that's just latent. Uh, yeah, that's that, that, yeah, it's a chicken and egg thing, right? Because I do think a certain personality is drawn to accounting, but that doesn't mean that those people aren't creative or couldn't be innovative. Um, they certainly are when they leave public accounting and go into industry. So I don't think it's just, just the personality type that's drawn to become an accountant. I do think it's the business model. The business model pays lip service to innovation and creativity and the relationship, quite frankly. You just can't have uh, a relationship with, with and, and I don't want to put a number on it because it varies by firm and, and uh, subscription models scalable. I mean, Dr. Paul went from being a solo practitioner and now he's got four doctors working for him. It's scalable to the extent that you want it to scale. But Dr. Paul only has 500 patients. He's limited. And that that means that he can spend as much time with you as you need um, to stay healthy. And you can't do that if you have a typical you know, GPS 3,000 patients. You just can't do that. How you can have a relationship with 3,000 customers? Or you, know, you, you meet firms that have 1,000, they do 1,000 tax returns or more during busy season. You don't have a relationship with those people. You have a transactional uh, you know, relationship with those people. You, they come in, they get their taxes done, but you're not their trusted advisor. You don't know much about their, their business. You, you know, what it means to be a trusted advisor. I need to know what the answer are. The answers are to those five most important questions I asked you from Peter Drucker. You know, what is our purpose? Who is your customer? If you can't answer those for your business advisory customers, you have no business advising them. And if all you can answer is their tax situation, you are not doing business advisory services. Yeah, for sure. There are a lot of CPAs who I think just don't have the time because of the billable hour. I mean, this it's like cancer, right? It's like just spreads everywhere. It causes all kinds of problems. I shouldn't liken it because cancer is obviously much No, more. but it's the same thing. It's growth for the sake of growth, right? Which is the ideology of the cancer cell. Um, and it is a big problem. And that's even true to some extent with VP. VP hasn't changed that that behavior of growth for the sake of growth. It has in some firms, but but not in others. But the business model, the subscription would force you to grow logically and you know organically probably. Yeah, it forces you, like you say, to put the customer at the center. And I think that there are a lot of CPAs who don't fully understand what their business owning clients are trying to create because they just don't have time because of the billable hour, right? It just means you don't have time for your clients to understand what they're trying to do. And when you don't have time to understand you can't help them build it or their comfort zone just doesn't go there because the, the you know i'm so I'm, I'm over this talk about shifting to advisory we've been talking about this for 40 years my co-author paul dunn who wrote the firm of the future started a company back in the late 80s to help accountants make this shift and we still haven't done it and it could just be that accountants don't want to do that type of work. You know, they don't want to be McKinsey and Booz and Booz and and Bain and Company. They just don't want to do that work for whatever reason. That's okay. If all you want to do is stay in your lane, do accounting and tax, I still think there's ways to do that where you can add more value and and still give the customer that peace of mind, frictionless experience, all those things we talked about. Last two questions as we wrap up here. You're talking about 40 years advisory services, and this will take a long time for CPA firms to adopt. So I believe that anything is possible. What would need to be done in order for CPA firms to adopt this more quickly for the benefit of their clients and for their own benefit in their business? Uh, that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer because that's that's this, that's a $64 million question. I wish I would have had that answer for value pricing. I thought I did. I've become much more humble about our knowledge and our ability to change people. I don't think you can change anyone. Yeah, no. The only thing that changes people is enlightened self-interest. Yeah. So, you know, it's it, it, it's it's a cop-out for me to say, well, go educate yourself on the subscription model. You know, read John Warlow's book. Read Teenzo. Subscribe. Attend a, a subscribe conference. They, they still did them last year virtually. Um, they're very inspiring. I mean, I uh, it, I can't keep up with what's going on in subscription. It's like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, but what I do know is it's an evolutionary phase. We're moving from the means to the end. So what I mean by that is imagine a drug company that would say to you, 
Geraldine, we have this drug that can, that can lessen your chance of a stroke or a heart attack. And you'll take it for a few years. And you know what? If you get a heart attack, they'll refund your money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you're paying them for the ends. In other words, it's perf- they're putting yeah. everything on the line. <laughs> Say, well, that's risky. Yeah. That's- yeah. That's what yep, that's, that's where called free market. <laughs> free markets are full of risk. Profits come from risk. So, it, and and so if you don't want to take risks, go be an employee. Um, but this but this pay for the ends. And we're not there yet. And subscription doesn't get us all the way here, there yet. But we're moving in that direction. So when I envision the the concierge medicine model or the DPC model, that's more of an ends type business model because. Now I'm not just there to keep you, get you healthy or when you're sick, but to keep you healthy. And that's a game changer. It's an absolute yeah. game changer. Okay. I love this. There's so much more here we could talk about, but let's give our listeners something small that they can bite off. If they're, if they're on board now and they're bought in, they're like, yes, I want to move in this direction, but I don't know where to start. Give them one place they can start. What's next? I guess I, I, my first question would be, well, how many customers do you have? And if they're like, say, you know, a small accounting firm or a small bookkeeping firm, they might only have 25 customers. Okay, put five of them on subscription. Just do it. Stop trying to get it perfect. Just do it. Just put them on, you know, give them three choices, up the price, uh, maybe do it with a new customer who comes in. You know, double your price, see what happens um, and and get the feedback. You'll adjust your tiers over time. But just just try it. Just try it. Now, I want you to be committed because I want you to keep going. Eventually, you're going to have to convert your existing customers. Um, and this is the perils of a small-scale experiment, right? You may not be committed to it. So if you fail the first couple times, you go, oh, well, you know, it's like Tiger Woods throwing his clubs on the ground after he hits it in the lake, right? This game's hard and he gives up. Yeah, the game's hard. So is training for the Olympics. So is passing the CPA exam. But you stick with it. So just try it get the feedback from your customers. Your customers are going to love this because it's a monthly payment. It's predictable. It's full transparency. It's convenience, peace of mind. All of those things that we talked about are incredibly valuable. Now you've got to deliver. You've got to give great service. You've got to be responsive. You've got to do, and you can't do that if you have, you know, 9 million customers. But if you have a smaller customer base, you have, you always have the capacity and we want our professionals to have capacity. I want my dentist to be able to see me when I have a toothache. I don't want to be told, oh, you have to wait a week. Yeah. No. <laughs> I want to be able to come yeah. in now. No. And you need to fit me in. That means he's always got to have spare capacity. He doesn't know when it's going to be utilized, but he knows things are going to come up. And you have to have the same attitude. And you, you got to just break that link between revenue and capacity. Yeah. I don't want my tax returns done in August. I want to know how much money I owe the government so I know how much I have left to spend <laughs> or invest in my business. Yep. Ron Baker, it is always a pleasure to interview you. Thank you so much for coming on the Smart Strategy for CPAs podcast. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Geraldine. Appreciate it. Does the idea of pricing up front make you go deer in the headlights? You wish you could, but you don't know how? The next time you charge somebody 75 bucks for the 30 minutes it took to run a tax plan that saved your client $25,000, stop what you're doing and head over to SheThinksBigCoaching.com to subscribe to my daily drip of business strategy for CPAs. You'll get one easily digestible tip a day on how to position your business, how to price your services, and how to sell outcomes so that you can be more profitable, get your time back, and get off the tax hamster wheel for once and for all. That URL again is shethinksbigcoaching.com. All right, that's it from me. Have a great week.